Now it's on. This is another one of my pop culture road shows where I take a look at some of the items that I have from the 50s through the 90s that I collect and sell online and try and learn a little something about them, see if there's any sort of art history background or just something interesting to learn. The first up, what I have is glamour, glitter, fashion, and fame, Gem. Gem, she is truly outrageous, truly, truly, truly outrageous. Whoa, oh, 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 Gem. The music is contagious, outrageous. Gem is her name. No one else is the same. Gem is her name. And then, of course, there's the Misfits. Their songs are bitter. They are the Misfits, these ones right here. And they're going to get her. But Gem, Gem is truly outrageous. Truly, truly, truly outrageous. Whoa, oh, Gem, Gem. The music's contagious, outrageous. Gem's her name. No one else is the same. Gem is her name, Gem. Yes, I actually know the lyrics to the entire thing. I rewatched the series like not too long ago. <laughs> I knew the whole thing. It just kept going. So I have this book here that's actually called Gem Night of a Thousand Earrings. Uh, because as you know, the concept is gem. Okay, here's the thing. Looking up the history of Gem and actually watching the show, you don't realize how utterly absurd the storyline is until you read it back. The series is a joint collaboration by Hasbro. Hasbro actually, it was during the time period when they created He-Man. They were making cartoons like G.I. Joe, um, the Transformers, which when I was a kid didn't realize that they were specifically just made to sell products. Like, they literally would go, make a cartoon, then we're going to make a toy out of each thing that you put in that cartoon. One of the people who worked on it that actually worked on the series for G.I. Joe and the Transformers, creating the storylines for it, was Chrissy Marks. Ran the show from 1985 to 1988. It actually had 65 episodes. So anyway, the absurdity of the storyline is... So the characters that are in it, which is Jerrica, who lives a double life as Jem as well. Synergy, whoops, this side. Synergy is a, a synthesizer that was created by Jerrica Jem, uh, by her father, to be the ultimate audiovisual entertainment synthesizer. And it was bequeathed, bequeathed to her at his death. Uh, so he ran a record company, he died, uh, I think it was even like there were mysterious circumstances behind his death, but he had been right, basically creating something, this thing here, Synergy, to run, make the best songs in the world. It was going to make the ultimate songs, wear these earrings and as holograms be what they should be that people would love that write the songs. And for some reason, they all lived in a house together. They started an orphanage. I don't know why she couldn't be both Jerrica and Jem, but... I don't know. So that's the concept of it. So ha uh, Hasbro actually hired an advertising agency um, to run and create the 65 episodes that they did. And one of the people in that advertising agency who wrote jingles, uh, his daughter auditioned for the voice of Jerrica and Jem, and her name was Samantha Newark. Now, the funny thing is, is when she was a child, she was actually a child singing star in... I believe it was Africa, where they lived before they moved to, to America. So even though she voiced Jem, the uh, singing part of Jem was done by a woman named Samantha Newark. No, wait. Britta Phillips uh, was the singer. Regardless, they weren't done by the same people, but the woman who did the voice of Jem was a singing star, but didn't actually do any of the singing. Both of them were musicians, is what it amounts to. Even though they included a music video in each episode because of MTV. They were trying to make the cartoons more like MTV. So they wrote a new song, at least one new song for each episode. Um, there was no official releases of gem soundtracks or videos or anything else aside from the cartoon Into the Wild until they started releasing the dolls, the toys that came out for each character. And each one of those characters would get a cassette single with an A and a B side that featured 
one of the songs from the soundtrack of the cartoon. And that was the only stuff that you could get as far as the music from the program Gem. Gem being actually really successful, Barbie then came out, Barbie dolls came out with their own uh, rock music line and just created their own, fabricated their own, like here's Barbie in a rock outfit, here's Barbie's friend in a rock outfit. And essentially the gem sales started to dwindle, then the cartoon ended, they canceled it. Christy Marks, who wrote the series actually later on, said that the uh, whole storyline was basically the concept was a soap opera for kids is what it was, but it involved rock music. So that was what I learned about Gem and uh, this being the book for it called Gem in the Night of a Thousand Earrings, 1986. Next up, I have another book that I was hoping to find out more about, but it's a movie story book from Big Top Pee Wee, the movie Big Top Pee Wee, starring Pee Wee Herman, of course. So this was the follow-up to the Pee Wee's Big Adventure movie that was wildly successful. But then when this movie came out, and I got this book here that has stills from the movie, there's Pee Wee waking up his pig in the morning for his to work on his farm. Like, do you even... I, I didn't even remember the concept of Big Top Pee Wee. He ran a farm uh, in a small town where everybody kind of hated him, which was an interesting concept. So, like, they didn't like him. And then, a, and then a twister comes through town. There he is, kind of like the Wizard of Oz, where he's trying to get in the basement while the hurricane or the tornado is coming through, and it blows a circus into his town. And there's the trapeze artist that he actually wants to date but he is supposed to be dating the girl that already lives in the town etc that's the concept of the story i was hoping to find out more about the story and the making of it because uh i don't know i was just interested in why it was made and why it was done this way but really the only thing i can find online is that everybody hated the movie that was basically it all the reviews were this isn't a good movie the one thing that i did find out is that this movie was not released by the same picture company warner brothers it was produced by uh, Paramount Pictures. So Danny Elfman, who was the only thing that was connected to the previous movie, uh, Tim Burton had nothing to do with it, which he did the uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. But uh, because it was on a different production company, Danny Elfman, who did the music, could not use any of the themes or make any uh, sort of connection musically to the other one because uh, it was produced by a different company. So they didn't have the rights to use any of that theme music, which is funny because I feel like Danny Elfman writes the exact same score for everything he does. Boom! Hey, take that, Danny Elfman. Guy who's more widely successful than I am. The other thing, too, was uh, who did direct it instead of Tim Burton was uh, Randall Kleiser, and he is the person who directed the first Grease movie. And then the other thing that was of note that I found is that if you look in this picture storybook here, Duke the Dog Face Boy is one of the characters, and it is played by Benicio Del Toro, and apparently it is his very first major motion picture on-screen role. That was what I found out about uh, Pee Wee's, or Big Top Pee Wee, I almost said Pee Wee's Big Adventure, even myself I wanted to say the better one, and that was from 1988. So this thing, here's another thing that I was hoping to find more about because it's darn interesting, but it is Mr. Rembrandt, the world's most uh, unusual artist. And what it is, is it's a toy from the 70s from the company Ideal. And again, the only thing I could find out about it, aside from what I know from just looking at the toy, which is kind of an automated robot spirograph. So it's this robot here. Um, it's, it's still strapped in, so I don't want to take it out, but it's a robot that is battery powered and it has these, um, s different sort of, what is it? They're spirals, but when you put them in, the robot drives around in different directions and actually draws patterns. And these markers, which two of them are missing, but the markers go into these, the front and back on both sides of the robot and it goes around and actually draws perfect circles and different designs and stuff like that on a large piece of paper that comes with 
the toy called uh, Rembrandt themed drawing paper. Here's some of the designs and the instructions that it can do, these little spirals and circles. So like I said, it's just like a spirograph if you know what those are. But I couldn't find anything else about it. Um, so I ended up looking up Ideal because I've had a couple of Ideal toys from the company Ideal, which is right, oh, there is it, right there. They made Kerplunk, which is also a gigantic, gigantic toy that the box is bigger than it needs to be, which this one's that way too. They did the Archie Bunker Joey Stivic baby toy because they also invented uh, Ideal back in the day. The, their biggest toy to date was the Betsy Wetsy doll. The company started by making teddy bears back in 1907. And they also advertised their dolls as unbreakable since they were made of a composition of material of sawdust and glue. I mean, technically you can't break sawdust. So that was how they touted their toys. So most of their products, uh, they did Betsy Wetsy and uh, introduced in 1934 and they made that for like 50 years. I thought Betsy Wetsy was introduced like in the 60s, but apparently it was way earlier than that. Uh, they also started making hobby toys and they shifted to games like uh, the game Mousetrap, which also is a giant obtrusive, too many parts, giant box game. And they did a game called Hands Down. And then they also included a line of Evil Knievel toys, which I would love to get some of those. I used to have the pull string Evil Knievel motorcycle thing that you'd shoot off and you'd do jumps. Before they collapsed, uh, they made their most wildly successful toy, which was um, something that they had originally only released in Hungary. When they imported it from Hungary uh, in 1980, they renamed it the Rubik's Cube, which became very successful. And that was actually a very small toy. So it was one of the last things that they released. And that is, I at least learned about Ideal, but not Mr. Rembrandt, the world's most unusual artist. Care Bears. Gotten some Care Bear stuff over the years and I wanted to find out more about Care Bears themselves. So I have this book here called The Care Bears Battle the Freeze Machine, based upon the TV special. I mainly wanted to learn about the artwork of the Care Bears. So they were created by the American, uh, what was it, the American Greeting Card Company. So it's, you know how people joke and say Valentine's Day is a fabrication of the greeting card company? Well, Care Bears actually are. They were made after the success of the American Greeting Card Company's first uh, big franchise, which was Strawberry Shortcake. That was made uh, in 1979. That was, I didn't know that that was made by the American Greeting Cards Company either. But they introduced the characters for the Care Bears in 1981 through a line of greeting cards. It was specifically just a theme and then it kind of spiraled into a bigger thing, much like Strawberry Shortcake. Here's the weird thing too. They released these, or when they built these things, they kept it a secret. So they gave them project names, like secret code names, although the code names weren't as impressive as the idea that they're doing that. So Strawberry Co uh, Shortcake was referred to as Project One, and uh, then they called the Care Bears franchise Project Two, so they would uh, be able to keep it secret until the advertising is ready. In 1982, the Care Bears were announced as a toy line. They starred in the first TV special called The Land Without Feelings. But basically what it was, a boy decided he was unhappy and wanted to run away from home, so he went to The Land Without Feelings, and the Care Bears had to save him from that. That was the first movie, So that was, that, but it was a TV movie. Then, uh, to follow up on the success of that, they followed up with a story called The Care Bears Battle the Freeze Machine. It's not just a boy running away from home, but uh, he's being bullied and apparently being bullied with a baseball bat. This, this, this bully here in the book is hitting him with a baseball bat. So that's terrifying. So some of the elements of the franchise was based on King Arthur and the Round Table. So for example, example the uh, place that they lived was called Carolot, kind of like Lancelot, the legendary, or Camelot, sorry, Camelot, the legendary castle. And then the Care Bear family sits around a heart-shaped table, like the Knights of the Round Table, similar to that. And Sir Lancelot's name inspired the name of Sir Lovelot, which I just happen to have here. I was actually kind of surprised that I had this when I was looking that up. So I was, that's what this one is. And 
That is what I learned about the Care Bears. That's all that I have for today. Just learned a little bit about different backgrounds and artwork and things that I have. And I also sang you the gem theme song. So that's what I got. Those are all of the stuff that I have today. That's the end of my Pop Culture Roadshow. Thanks so much. All right, I'm gonna turn this off here.